wow. and have done a number of people in, in communication mm -hmm. and information processing. Mm -hmm. And then I got word of the fact they had this Institute of Columbia only just a couple of years oh. ago, and then have been to a few of those sessions. Mm -hmm. And Ellie Noem is really, I mean, he's really a, a nice guy as well as he's <laughs> got the, the territory code. Welcome. Welcome very much to Conversations, where I'm pleased to welcome to the program Professor Nadine Strasser. She's a, at, she's a professor at New York Law School here in New York City, and she's all so perhaps more relevant to what we want to talk about today, the president of the American Civil Liberties Union. And uh, Nadine, welcome very, very much to Conversation. I'm so happy to be here, Harold. Yes, and to Manhattan Network. Uh, we're going to talk about civil liberties and some of the threats to them and the, and the, the, you know, the American Civil Liberties Union as an institution in detail. But I wonder maybe you could, we find people like that, if you could share a little of your own background, just personal background, academic or something, and then we could just start talking about some of the poss possibilities and problems maybe as far as safeguarding civil liberties. Great. Well, I am a graduate of Harvard College and Harvard Law School mm -hmm. and practiced law for quite a few years both in my home state of Minneapolis, uh, Min Min Minnesota, yeah. uh, and in New York City mm -hmm. and uh, had always been interested and committed to civil liberties. So while I was in private practice, I did many, many volunteer cases mm -hmm. for the ACLU and for other human rights groups and a few years ago I became a full-time law professor teaching constitutional law and civil liberties and continue my activism with the ACLU in various capacities. For a few years I was one of the national general counsel of the ACLU, one of the uh, three lawyers who advise on legal strategy and I was very proud to follow in the footsteps of my heroine yeah. Ruth Bader Ginsburg oh, who right, had previously right, yeah, been right, right. national general counsel. But speaking uh -huh. of, of Ruth and her enormous contributions to women's rights, yeah. I am the first first female president of the ACLU. And I'm very proud of that since we've existed uh, since 1920. Right. It was about time that we crashed through that glass ceiling about of our time. own. I mean, that's the same year you all got the vote. It's about time you got some uh, clout on the, uh, on the board here. And congratulations. Thank and you. It's, uh, oh, we're doing it. That, that's, that's very good. Um, I wonder, maybe we could. We want to talk about it, but maybe we could get a few things uh, straight. You, as you said, the American Civil Liberties Union was started in 1920. So we're over 75 years uh, young now mm -hmm. in the institution. But maybe we get a few definitions of terms or something. When we talk about civil liberties, what are we talking about? Uh, what, is this, what is civil liberties that we're concerned with at the Union? You know, that is an excellent question, Harold, because it's not something that is set forth in any legal document, such as the United States Constitution. Essentially, it is fundamental freedoms mm -hmm. that belong to all individuals, regardless of race, gender, any other social category that society may put them into. Mm -hmm. uh, having said that, that is the general conception of civil liberties, uh, there still are a lot of disagreements, including among civil libertarians, as to exactly what they are and exactly how they should be defined in particular cases. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Civil liberties, now we're talking American Civil Liberties uh, Union, so we're talking about the United States and a certain, what, um, body of law and a body of uh, belief and percepts that have grown up with this particular society. Uh, um, there would be, is there a universal concept of civil liberties? Uh, we do have the, I know you're also interested in what we call human rights. International That's human rights. International human mm -hmm. rights, or hu international human rights. We did have at the UN a thing called the uh, Universal Declaration Correct. of Human Rights. Mm -hmm. So we began to get at some overriding principles that we tried to ascribe to humanness and the rights of people that are of that species and so forth. Do we begin to get in that sort of thing on a world scale in terms of civil liberties or is it strictly an American proposition? Well, uh, the American Civil Liberties Union is concerned only with protecting rights of individuals against violations by the United States government officials or government officials in this country. Mm -hmm. uh, I, as an individual, yeah. am very concerned about human rights on a worldwide basis, but mm -hmm. that is beyond the mission of the ACLU. Having right. said that, yes. we work very closely with sister organizations in other countries who are you know, their counterpart of the ACLU. And to me, one of the most exciting things that's happened recently with the spread of democracy and human rights all over the world is we see springing up 
organizations that are seeking to model themselves on the ACLU. Many of their activists come and visit our offices and, you know, get the benefit of our historic experience. For example, we recently had a number of meetings with a group of former political prisoners in the former Soviet Union mm -hmm. who are starting their counterpart of the ACLU. Yeah, I would think others. Do you think it's fair to say people have said of the United States, the United States is an interesting country. We've got everybody in the world has come to the United States in a certain sense. Um, it's perhaps less ethnically based than many countries in terms of the concept of nationality. It's very cosmopolitan in its mm -hmm. makeup. Um, but do, do you think it's fair to say that on a world scale, and I don't, we'll get back to the American mm -hmm. Civil Liberties Union, on a world scale, that the, the precepts that make up the body of thought relating to civil liberties here in the United States is in a certain sense a model to which the world feels it is a, it, concerned people around the world is a model to which people, concerned people around the world are able to in a sense repair in order yes. to get a sense of how we can structure society in broad general terms for the maximum freedom and benefit it's of certainly, the it's people. It certainly is true, Harold, as we've seen newly democratized countries around the world from many, many different regions of the world, they have modeled their new constitutions and their bills of rights very closely on the United States Constitution and our Bill of Rights. We do, after all, have the longest surviving constitution and constitutional democracy in human history. Mm -hmm. As you've already indicated, it's one that's shown itself to be flexible through time, thanks in part to the amendment process, thanks to the broad and open-ended language in which it was written to make it adaptable to changing circumstances. Having said that, mm -hmm. uh, I don't want to sound as if I have the arrogance of, in America, we know best. There are different cultures, different traditions, different values in other societies, and to that extent, the notion of universal international human rights is a little bit controversial. Yeah. Uh, I personally do believe that there are some fundamental rights that every human being is entitled to, mm. uh, regardless of such factors as culture and religion and society, but I do recognize that's a, a debatable proposition. Yeah, I understand, but I, I was only saying in a certain sense, and I wasn't being uh, chauvinistic or anything, I was just sort of being factual in the fact mm. that the United States is an amalgam. Factually. Actually, of so many peoples of the world. It's true. You know, and it's, it's interesting melting pot kind right. of thing. And factually, you can show how no. many constitutions all over the world are very closely modeled on ours, at least in, in theory, if uh -huh. not in practice. I'm not, I'll, I'll be coming back to that in a minute, but I wonder now, we, the American Civil Liberties Union takes into now 50 sovereign mm -hmm. entities or mm -hmm. states that mm -hmm. we have, and so, but sovereignty is also at the federal level. Mm -hmm. How do we work out that proposition, let's say, not without going to the world, maybe we'll come back to that <laughs> later, but going in terms of this political entity, the United States of America, there are differences that have been among regionally yes. and so forth in terms of uh, uh, civil rights right. or civ civil liberties. And uh, is there a, a calculus there that is worth our trying to understand well, to it, get a comprehensive It is. Well, to just to answer in terms of how the ACLU operates, I, one of the unique things about our organization is that we are the only nationwide network of activists all over the country. We have staffed offices in every single state mm -hmm. in this country. So we are the, the first and in some cases, sadly, the last line of defense for people everywhere when they feel their rights are violated. They don't have to you know, call some distant office in Washington, D.C. or New York, they can call somebody right in their own community, in their own state, who will be familiar with the particular problems there. And we certainly see some similar problems all across the country, but then there are particular regions where uh, there are challenges that are unique to those regions. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, the part of the country that likes to call itself the Bible Belt, yes. uh, you see a lot more challenges to uh, what's usually called separate of church and state mm -hmm. than you do in places such as New York where there's more religious heterogeneity. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, there was a, a lot of publicity recently about uh, some problems we've been having uh, in Alabama mm -hmm. where the governor uh, said that he would call out the uh, local um, police forces uh, in order to defend a judge who wants to continue to post in his courtroom mm -hmm. a copy of the Ten Commandments mm -hmm. and to 
lead members of the jury in Christian prayers before the beginning of the of the courtroom session, despite mm. the fact that that violates mm. the First Amendment's non-establishment of religion guarantee. Uh -huh. I don't think you would see that uh -huh. in a state like New York. No, I wouldn't think you would. You'd have a, you'd have a, you'd have a few people at the at the court state, and 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 the Scopes trial was in Tennessee, I think. You know, uh, at, 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 as far as science and religion and that sort of thing. But I think what I was getting at, if we've worked it out as a nation then. Uh, we've worked it out, the relationship between the federal and state or even local jurisdictional well, that's responsibilities actually not quite of the true. various states. Because you have very state no. Supreme Courts and very yeah, state systems. That's that actually work. very much contested. One okay. of the major battlegrounds before <laughs> the current United States Supreme Court is what we constitutional law professors call federalism, the mm -hmm. appropriate division of power between the federal government and the state governments. And in fact, um, in the recent years, we have seen a couple of Supreme Court decisions that have uh, really cut back on the scope of power national the na no. that, that the national government has. Mm -hmm. uh, most recently, in June of 1997, the United States Supreme Court struck down as unconstitutional a portion of the Brady Gun Control Act mm -hmm. uh, on the theory that it exceeded Congress's power mm -hmm. to impose regulations on state governments and on, on local governments. Uh, according to the Supreme Court, that gave too, took too much authority away from local police and local sheriffs. Uh, also, two years earlier, in 1995, for the first time in modern history, for the first time since the New Deal, this Supreme Court struck down another act of Congress as exceeding Congress's power to regulate. It also happened to be something, a, a law that had to do with gun control. Mm -hmm. So we're seeing, and, and these decisions were both by five to four votes with very, you know, passionately worded, strong dissents. Uh, so that's a tussle that continues to go on. And I think it's healthy, uh -huh. Harold. And I think it ultimately is something that uh, affirms individual rights because the separation of powers between the federal and the state governments and also among the different branches branches of the federal government is, is a way of limiting all government power to the ultimate benefit of individual rights. Are you concerned? We talk about that, and um, Mr. Clinton said the other uh, little while ago, we've come to the end of big government. A lot of people <laughs> are in opposition to uh, government itself as yeah. an institution. Uh, are we also concerned in terms of civil liberties with um, uh, perhaps not governmental infringements, although you have a particular, I presume, concern with the Constitution, Bill of Rights, and so forth, and the body of law that mm -hmm. makes up the, the governmental system of the country, but with uh, with uh, with with other private sector, corporate mm -hmm. uh, violations of. Uh, Power or something of that Absolutely. sort within the civic a society. And thank you so much for, for, for raising that yeah. point because many people are not aware of the fact that the Constitution only protects you against governmental infringements of your rights. The mm -hmm. most common complaint that the ACLU offices get all over the country, and, and every year we get literally hundreds of thousands of calls from people from all walks of life who say, my rights have been violated, please help me. Mm -hmm. And the most common complaint is actually not something that we can help them with under the Constitution. Namely, they say, my boss has violated my rights. Mm -hmm. And they think they have constitutional rights at work. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, they don't, mm -hmm. unless they happen to work for the government. Mm -hmm. uh, but our conception is that you should have fundamental rights at work, because it is a place where you spend so much of your waking time. Mm -hmm. So we are always struggling for other sources of protection mm -hmm. for basic rights. Mm -hmm. uh, and those would include statutes, mm -hmm. for example, right. the civil rights laws that protect you against discrimination in employment. Uh, even when you're working for the private sector. And uh, basically, we'd like to support something that we call the Employees Bill of Rights, a piece of legislation that we would like to have adopted that would protect everybody's basic privacy, freedom of speech, so long as it didn't interfere with or undermine the efficiency of, of their conduct as an employee. Yeah, so you, the Civil Liberties Union can take these things into into purview. The C American Civil Liberties Union, is it in a certain sense, I've noticed, or I'm curious, and it's maybe if this is uh, not the appropriate kind of question, just talk about something else. We I defend your <laughs> freedom of speech, Harold. Well, you would. If ever I need to be defended, <laughs> I can come to you, I know. But what, no, the, the part that I have in mind is Ameri uh, you, can have a, you can have an institution that will defend, and the American Civil Liberties Union has, the right of 
all people, particularly minority views and maybe artistic creativity and these kind of things, that they have a right to be said ra against the majority, as it were. And you, you, you staunchly defend that, and that's uh, written in the body of law, and there's a number of people concerned with that sort of thing. Is it, a pro is it the, the position of the, uh, and to defend that, and to take that position, to defend the right of others to say what they want to say and take positions, political, economic, and so forth? Even if is, we completely disagree with even them? Even if you completely disagree yes. is what, but that, then that, the that famous I'm, phrase from Voltaire, I, dis is, I disagree with what you say, but I defend what? to the death your right to say it. Right, okay, yeah, that kind of thing, you do that. But is it also in the keep, is it in keeping, or what is the role? of the, I can see an institution defending that in a third party kind of way or something. Uh, and is it also, and you just hinted on it when you said we would like to have, we would like to support the employee's law. Is it appropriate mm -hmm. for an institution that is defending all points of view, as it mm -hmm. were, to take positions relating to policy issues? And does the American Civil Liberties Union take positions that are of an opinion relating to uh, policy issues in the United and oh. is it appropriate for them to do that or how, how do we do that rather than just being a and uh, you know, abstractly defend oh, no. the, we the are right completely, of everyone to speak. No, we're not just a philosophical debating society. Well, I, I think it's very important mm -hmm. uh, to debate fundamental principles, and we certainly do that. But we do want to have an effect on policy, and we do that in several ways, uh, both by taking cases to court, uh, defending individuals um, through the court system, uh, but also in advocating in legislative bodies. And that means lobbying for laws that we see as protecting of civil liberties, for example, the civil rights legislation that has been passed starting in the 1960s. We've always lobbied in favor of those laws. Conversely, lobbying against laws that are being proposed that, in our view, violate civil liberties. Mm -hmm. uh, and we also advocate in public forums, on TV and uh, in the, the media generally. So we try to use all tools to affect public opinion and public policy. In order to safeguard the right of people to hear a wide variety of Exactly, views. and, so, and, and we would certainly defend the right of people who are going to advocate different points of view yeah. to advocate those points of view while saying, we think you're wrong. I can understand that. Okay, I, I can understand that. And you, you had in there in your language saying, if there is a, a law that's being passed that's going to violate people's right to speak, you will go against that law because your charge is to make it possible for there to be a free flow of information. What I'm getting at is it would the civil liberties take a position on the flat tax? Or would they take a position on, do you understand, a position right. that isn't relating to no. defending the right of the mass of the society no. to have our, their our, say? Our, our, our role is to defend and expand civil liberties. And this gets us back to the question that you asked earlier, what are civil liberties? There are certain core issues where we all agree, but we're constantly re-examining mm -hmm. what is a legitimate civil liberties issue. Mm -hmm. For example, mm -hmm. uh, the ACLU has not always, throughout its entire history, uh, opposed the death penalty. Mm -hmm. uh, that okay, was something uh, you know we debated, and ultimately we adopted a position in opposition to it. Uh, Likewise, we did not from the very beginning consider the issue of whether a woman has a fundamental right to an abortion. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm happy to say that we were the first national organization to call for such a right, um, but it was a, a couple of decades after our organization first came into existence. Mm -hmm. So. I hope this comparison doesn't sound pretentious, but it's like the United States Supreme Court, which has changed and evolved its own conception of what are constitutional rights throughout our history. You know, after all, uh, to take the example of, of women's rights and abortion, uh, it was only very recently that the United States Supreme Court concluded that women have constitutionally protected equality rights and reproductive freedom rights. So they've changed as far as the rights are concerned of the people. I noted that you, you have a position paper on finance reform, mm -hmm. campaign finance, a big issue in the right. society, and you feel it's appropriate that you have an issue because our view is that a lumber of You're not the like a court in the sense where they, they're supposed to just be interpreting things and so forth. You're actually taking policy positions But on only issues. if we believe that civil liberties are involved. For example, okay. uh, many of the uh, proposals for campaign finance reform, in fact, I, I think it's fair to say virtually all of them, in our view, violate fundamental civil liberties of freedom of expression mm -hmm. by uh, imposing limitations on campaign uh, contributions and on campaign expenditures. Uh -huh. uh, so when the Reform Act was passed in the early 70s, the ACLU 
went to court, challenged it, in a, and that resulted in a very famous Supreme Court decision called Buckley versus Vallejo. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, we didn't completely win that case, mm -hmm. and I think the Supreme Court came out with the worst of both worlds. But basically, uh, it accepted our key argument, which is that if you are spending money or contributing money in support of a political candidate or uh, a political referendum, that is a vital expression of your political philosophy. Mm -hmm. And restrictions on it, therefore, uh, uh, are violated, violate the First Amendment freedom of speech with respect to the most important freedom of speech, speech about political issues, about the democratic process. Yeah. Now, having said that, Harold, yeah. um, the goal of reformers is something that also so mm -hmm. uh, raises civil liberties concerns that are right. also uh, deeply important to the ACLU, yeah. namely uh, the right of equal access to the political process. Mm -hmm. Regardless of who you are and regardless of how much money you have, mm -hmm. you should have an equal opportunity to participate as a voter, as a candidate. Mm -hmm. And we are very concerned about the limitations of the current system from that perspective. But mm -hmm. our view is that uh, limits on expenditures and contributions are not going to accomplish the reform that uh, they are vaunted mm -hmm. to do. Indeed, I think the past uh, um, couple of decades mm -hmm. of experience mm -hmm. under those limitations proves the point. Mm -hmm. They have really entrenched the, the two major political parties. It's very difficult for minor party candidates or third party candidates to uh, achieve the kind of support under the current system that they need to, to make a case to the voters. You must do a great deal there, not only personally, but in the, in, in the, in the chambers of the council uh, on the one hand. But on the other hand, Absolutely. It's, so, it's like Solomon. I mean, yeah. You're making so, solemn-like kind of... Uh, you have you know. to. There are a lot of situations yeah. where there are conflicts between different civil liberties or constitutional rights. To take one that um, we've had a lot of debates about recently and, and also some policy positions, um, sexual harassment in the workplace when it involves expression. As I told you, we believe very strongly that people should have basic freedom of expression at work, mm -hmm. uh, so long as it doesn't undermine the efficiency of the workplace or interfere with the rights of others. But where do you draw the line between mm -hmm. uh, where somebody's right to express even controversial ideas, even, may I say so, sexist ideas mm -hmm. in the workplace, mm -hmm. uh, to what extent can, is that consistent with the right of other employees right. to equality of opportunity in a non-harassing, mm -hmm. non-intimidating, non-hostile workplace or these or these questions rise also just in civic space just mm -hmm. out in the environment as a whole there's questions uh, I mean other than in an employment situation there are issues that are raised that are, are sometimes um, you know, having to be dealt with in some well, manner, there, or, means, there, or at least a philosophical debate among the people of the society. For, but for us, that would be a different issue because right. you see, and, and it is actually from a constitutional law perspective as mm -hmm. well, the Supreme Court has said many times, uh, correctly in my view, that when we're out on the public sidewalks where we can move freely about, uh, we are constantly going to be subjected or have the possibility of being subjected to fleeting glimpses of well, pictures we, we don't like to with. hear or <laughs> right, see. Right, right. And the answer is not mm -hmm. to shut down down the speech, uh -huh. but to walk on by. Uh -huh. Now, that analysis doesn't fit so neatly when you're talking about the workplace, okay. because somebody is there by virtue of economic necessity. It's right. not so easy so to a, just walk on by, particularly if the speaker is somebody who has economic power over you, exactly. such as your boss or your supervisor. Yeah, exactly. And this, I th if I, civil liberties has something, I think, to do with with uh, freedom and leisure, there's a certain ability that you have control over your own b being. Exactly. And that's something that we want to encourage in the society. Exactly. As a whole. And that's why I think it's very important to make the point that civil liberties is neither a conservative nor a right. liberal brief. Mm -hmm. uh, I think one can make the argument that there is nothing more conservative than conserving the fundamental values of individual dignity and autonomy uh, on which this country was based. Or to mm -hmm. take a more modern example, the slogan of conservatives such as Ronald Reagan and others is we want to get the government off people's backs and reduce the role of government in our lives. So I, I, I want to make that point because right. in 1988 um, uh, then Vice President George Bush got a 
lot of political capital for attacking Michael Dukakis, mm -hmm. the Democratic candidate, uh, as being a card-carrying member of the ACLU, Isn't to that use funny. that phrase, yeah. you know, and equating it with mm. the L word, yes. liberal, which was politically if unpopular. If not the Communist Party. If, exactly. <laughs> and I think that yeah, is a real McCarthy misunderstanding yeah. no. of constitutional rights and civil liberties. There's so many things. It's really challenging work. It's very important and that sort of thing. There's so many things. I wonder maybe we could talk a little bit about uh, communication. Mm -hmm. We're here in cable television and so mm -hmm. on, but communication and the, the, uh, the, prince of the freedom of the press, let's say, mm -hmm. freedom of the press, the freedom to mm -hmm. communicate. Mm -hmm. uh, we have these things were written, the ACLU, well, in Madison's day, it was a whole different world, I mean, that kind of thing. But uh, ACLU has come uh, 75 years ago, and now we've had the evolving of, um, of, of freedom of expression, and there's been a great deal of uh, difficulty uh, or a lot of contention over what can and cannot be allowed to be in what is loosely called the press. Mm -hmm. And there has been a distinction between print, if mm -hmm. I'm not mistaken, I don't know, there's pamphleteering and play mm -hmm. tablets and then mm -hmm. pamphleteering <laughs> and print, and then, um, you know, uh, radio, television, cable, and now internet and so forth mm -hmm. is coming and all of this kind of thing. I wonder, this is one of the things that is of major concern to you all at the American Civil Liberties Union? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, w when you're talking about an era where most communications are no longer by the methods that were common in the 18th century, the freedom of speech guarantee is going to be worthless if it doesn't apply to the forms of communications that are most relevant to people's lives now. Therefore, I am absolutely ecstatic and proud about a major victory victory that we won in the United States Supreme Court in June of 1997 mm -hmm. in a case called Reno, as in Janet Reno, our Attorney General, yeah. versus American Civil Liberties Union. Mm -hmm. uh, we went to court to challenge the Communications Decency Act, which had been passed by Congress and signed by President Clinton in 1996, imposing a straitjacket of censorship over the internet, online communications, and cyberspace. The government argued that the court should give less protection under the free speech guarantee to this new communications medium than it has given to older forms of communication mediums. Uh, we argued against that, and as I say, we won that point essentially nine to zero in the United States Supreme Court, which did say that uh, the, the internet communications medium should receive the same high degree of constitutional protection that the traditional print media has received. Now, having said that, uh, we in Every, earlier... It's all right. yes, Everything is having yes. said that. Right? It, because I'm there's the all... It's so other. complicated. I, know, I understand. No, that's good. You're seeing And, you know, the, yeah. Supreme, yeah. the Supreme Court makes mm. decisions incremental, incrementally mm. when a particular case is brought before it. Right. So it's not as if they say, well, here's a case dealing with the Internet. In light of this decision, why don't we re-examine our rules regarding broadcasting? Yeah. And, in fact, in earlier cases, the Supreme Court had applied a lesser degree of protection to broadcast communications sure. and cable communications oh, and than to print. And I think that um, the court in the right case will re-examine that and upgrade the free speech protection of broadcasting. But it hasn't yet had the occasion to do that. Maybe you can enlighten us a little bit. We had the, you know, the freedom of, you know, back in pamphleteering days of Tom, uh, I mean, Benjamin Franklin and so forth, they were pamphleteering. It took three months to get a letter to England, I think, something like that. And then there, there is an attitude toward that, and I heard you say that it has changed. Now, now we come into electricity, we come into the radio and so forth. The attitude toward these new emerging, as far as the st structure of the law and so forth, uh, has, been, uh, has it been more restrictive of the new technologies mm -hmm. as they appeared traditionally than the old yes. ones? Yes, and I, I think in some ways courts are, in many ways, courts are reflective of the societies okay. of which they're a part. That's right. inevitable. And right. every time there is a new communications medium, starting with the printing press, right. um, and even beyond that, of, uh, of pro no doubt, uh, the powers that be get quite nervous. Uh-oh, mm -hmm. it's going to be a lot easier and faster faster and cheaper to reach a larger audience More and ju effective. just think of all the dangerous ideas that will be out there. And you know the usual suspects, mm -hmm. sex, violence, terrorism, subversion, blasphemy, and it can reach mm -hmm. children, mm -hmm. and it can reach the masses, the unwashed masses. We better do something about that. So every time there is a new communications medium, the first reaction of government is to clamp down through censorship. And mm -hmm. um, 
that's happened throughout yeah. history. It happened with films, it happened with radio, TV, television. The internet is no exception. And mm -hmm. it has uh, often taken the courts a little bit of time to catch up and to say, hey, wait a minute, this is the 20th century or the 21st century counterpart of the printing presses that our founding fathers were trying to protect through the First Amendment. Right. So if you take the values that they enshrined in the First Amendment, you have to apply them to media that they didn't even dream of then. Did they anticipate it? Were they, they were an incredible array of politically astute people mm -hmm. who put together those constitutional mm -hmm. structure at the beginning of this republic and so forth. But did they, they anticipate, they would have been hard to anticipate the coming of radio, uh, you know, because they didn't mm -hmm. have the knowledge base and so forth. Anticipate those kind of things and make a way for those within the structure or if we had to change things. And then also is uh, like say in the case of print, uh, they would allow something to be said in print that they wouldn't allow, let's say, in their standards and practices at all the networks. The mm -hmm. network television is going out all over and into the homes visually and in an audio way, not mm -hmm. only in print and mm -hmm. linear print and so forth. Do they make a distinction between the kind of communication as being, well, it would be all right to have that in print, mm -hmm but it wouldn't be all right to have it to where you can mm. actually see it. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, the Constitution was uh, often written in very broad terms mm -hmm. and sometimes written in very narrow terms. Uh, so I believe that uh, it's a very rational interpretation to say that when the framers wanted to maintain flexibility, to allow the Constitution to be applied to circumstances that they couldn't possibly foresee, they deliberately used broad language. The term the freedom of speech is a very broad term, mm -hmm. especially when you recognize that that same First Amendment also refers to freedom of the press. Now, the press was the dominant medium of the time. Mm -hmm. If they only wanted to protect that, why did they also add this broad phrase freedom of speech. Mm -hmm. I think it leads to a very strong argument that they intended it to be expansive. And our uh, great early Chief Justice John Marshall mm -hmm. famously said, you know, the Constitution was intended to endure for ages to come to crises that could not be foreseen in mm -hmm. human events. Yeah, and it has. It's been amazingly adapt uh, at, at changing and so forth. But this question again of, of, of reflecting values and uh, just to take uh, some, some exam. I mean, uh, if if you have something in print and then it was on, tel you you would be able to put something in print in a magazine, have it all over the country with no objection. But if you tried to put it on, quote unquote, national television, mm -hmm. let's say some explicit act, uh, mm -hmm. sexual or something like that. Mm -hmm. There was a stricture against that that held and was there able still to hold. is and still is. But I, the Supreme and Court has not recently reevaluated it when it upheld those limitations on broadcast expression. Uh, it did so based on some uh, factual premises that are no longer true if they ever were true. What? The most important was what's called the scarcity rationale. Okay. That there is a limited amount of spectrum space that <laughs> the government has chosen to license these few privileged uh, monopolists, if you will, to get the, the broadcast licenses and therefore the government can impose additional limitations on them that it would not be able to impose when you have uh, anybody literally has the ability to start a newspaper for example, at least in theory. In theory. In not not they, in terms of economic reality. As long as they can afford the press, Mr. Beaverbrook said, yeah. I think. Now, yeah. Yeah. Um, the United States Supreme Court has said in a few recent cases, it, this was not um, an issue directly before the court, but a few justices have commented in their opinion, gee, that, that's, that's scarcity of the spectrum, if it ever existed, clearly uh, does not exist anymore, especially when you consider changing government policies, when you consider the proliferation of new media. Therefore, we ought to re-examine our stringent limits on broadcast expression. Let me mention one other very important concern here, Harold, and that mm -hmm. was the notion that uh, TV and radio are these unwanted, assaulted intruders into the home, or oh, parents can't stop their children from seeing things on TV uh, that they might be able to stop them from seeing in, in other contexts. And, and I think that is a legitimate concern, but the way to deal with that is through technology such as lock boxes that will allow parents to um, stop their children from seeing what they don't want their own kids to see without depriving the entire adult population mm. of access to that material as well. Yeah, it's interesting. George Gilder is talking. He's, you know, he has certain kinds of political views, and, and, and there's this incredible 
micro macrocosm he talks about of the mm -hmm. silicon revolution that we're going through and he uses an expression that is interesting it is a bandwidth spectrum there was limited bandwidth when we were limited to over the air broadcasting mm -hmm. and so forth we had cable creeping in and so forth but now he uses the thing and bucky fuller used to use it too on a very large tableau when he looked at the the whole proposition of technological extension of consciousness that that we were reaching a point where the fundamental assumption of scarcity as a, well, for want of a better term, an ontologic reality mm -hmm. in the world, which we've lived in throughout the human experience, was being transcended by technological right. success. George Gildler now, I don't know if he has reference to that kind of large mm -hmm. argument, but he does talk in the, in the, in the communications that we're transcending scarcity. Uh, really, and the Internet is and the perfect paradigm a, of that. Excuse me, that does make a difference in terms of the constitutional law understanding. Absolutely freedom of press and so forth right, which in is fundamentally in important ways? But that is exactly okay. why the Supreme Court came out the way it did mm -hmm. on the Internet case, because the Internet is the paradigmatic example mm -hmm. of in infinity in mm -hmm. terms of potential access both as a speaker, mm -hmm. anybody mm -hmm. can get up there and reach an audience of literally anybody else all over the world. Yes, so, well, yes, and that... Uh, does right, and that does bring implications in terms of what we might be able to take the the model of the freer freer standards that were set for print, and begin to have those apply to the electronic media, right. more than having the stringent controls of the electronic media filtering down and, 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 that and is exactly, stifling free expression. That is exactly yeah. how the battle lines were drawn. Uh, as in, 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 in Reno with versus? Re exactly. Uh -huh. and, you know, I debated uh, everybody from Ralph Reed and Pat Robertson, who were of the Christian Coalition lobbying very strongly in favor of the Communications Decency Act. Uh -huh. And the argument they made, both in public fora and in the courts, was the court should apply the broadcast model of lesser protection of speech mm -hmm. to the Internet rather than the print model of mm -hmm. more freedom of speech speech. Again, I want to emphasize that I completely defend the right of parents, and it is a right that the Supreme Court has recognized as being protected under the Constitution, to make their own decisions about the upbringing and education of their children. I'm mm -hmm. all in favor of facilitating parental control, at <coughs> least to a certain point. At a certain point, you have to recognize that the young person has his or her own rights. But let's assume we're talking about a young child here. Uh, the way to deal with that is not through government censorship, but through technological approaches that will allow parents to do the screening and the filtering and the monitoring and the blocking in their own homes, mm -hmm. screening what comes into their homes rather than stopping everybody in the country, adult and child alike, from seeing things that they happen to object to. Lacking effective technology that allows that to happen. We do what have te effective technology, Well, let's though. say allow allowing effective dissemination of technological mm -hmm. knowledge base of how to do that. We yeah. have that. And that's yeah. another question, and those are questions that are broad metaphors or the broad questions of what technologically we are capable of as a human species in terms of what mm -hmm. economically and otherwise we're able mm -hmm. to realize. That's a large philosophical question of uh, governance on a mm -hmm. large scale on this spaceship Earth. But given that fact and everything, that, that with, you know, the V-chips and other kinds of things, that if it's not there now, it is though in this interim period, mm -hmm. would we do better to... Uh, be on the conservative side of no. trying to stifle Ex speech, or do you think we should try and uh, go as fast as we can trying to create this uh, more uh, idealistically seen, perhaps, or, well, or all win kind of situation that might be possible? Well, we technology heralds. We absolutely have to start with the premise of free speech. It's decreed in the Constitution, and in fact, the Supreme Court itself uh, said that. We can't um, impose a straitjacket of censorship on the hope that in the future technological changes might allow us to lift it. We start with the premise of free speech, but, but in fact, have. the software mm -hmm. uh, already exists. It's simply going to become more refined and easier to use. But from the get-go, mm -hmm. uh, because of the great consumer demand for this, there have been all kinds of programs that will allow the blocking of particular material that is deemed not appropriate for children. And, it's and there's a big consumer yeah. demand for this, obviously, mm -hmm. and the, the software providers are scrambling every day to make it easier and more, I mean, easier to use, but more sophisticated in terms of being individualized and customized to each parent or each individual's interests and values and tastes. Right. We still have a, we still have a, a lot of, and there's a question of making that economically available to mm -hmm. people in situations particularly, and it brings it again. We started out with civil liberties on a national scale, uh, 
and so forth. And uh, it's really a, it's really interesting in a certain sense. There's many things we could talk about there. But you were arguing this case for the internet, and the internet is not an American proposition. No, the internet it's a worldwide is whether, So we are now not talking about in the case of internet. We're not talking about an American civil liberties issue. No, we're talking about a universal. Yeah. Maybe we need a new institution called the Universal Civil Liberties Union. Well, actually... Or it's introducing me again back yes, to that question yes. I started well, with you about we live in an international world yeah. now, and the Internet is international. It's right. bringing us into a new pattern. And does the standard be set here in the United States be one that can resonate with people and with our, some of our notions of an open society, there are some people who around the world who do not agree with that. Mm -hmm. And haven't we had difficulty where somebody in another sovereignty mm -hmm. will try and censor, in a certain sense, what can be on the Internet mm -hmm. we um, certainly have. that has ramifications about what's available to us? And how do we work that out? It seems to me we're becoming internationalized willy-nilly or necessarily we're becoming into a global village. Right. And well, do we take account of that? For precisely that reason, mm -hmm. um, uh, within the last couple of years, the ACLU organized and is one of the founders of something called the Global Internet Liberty Coalition, mm -hmm. GILK, uh, yeah, is the Gilk. acronym, <laughs> sounds like geek, right? Uh, precisely yeah. recognizing that uh, we, our own privacy rights as well as free speech rights could be held hostage to the lowest common denominator that's right. going to be imposed by some totalitarian society right. uh, elsewhere in the world and that if we were to have freedom and privacy and other civil liberties in this new global medium mm -hmm. we need to be aware of what's going on and to combat civil liberties violations in other countries as well as our own so this is a campaign that involves cyber liberties and free speech organizations around the world and I, that's why I think I started this questioning on mm -hmm. that that is American civil liberties but we live in a in a in a, mm -hmm. in, a, in a in a world and are there are there are there movements let's say outside of the American sovereign nation state as it is and of course American civil liberties is tied to that law and we mm -hmm. have a unique history many people are interested in our constitutional history and they see that as a model but uh, is there something like the American Civil Liberties Union that's beginning to evolve on an international scale? Are we setting up sister institutions? Are they beginning to yes. come together? Well, and uh, do you think we could get to where we would have something like the UCLU, the Universal Civil Liberties Union, or ICLU, or something, to begin to deal with a global world that is the real world, particularly in communications mm -hmm. and other things, rather than being ourselves, Mm -hmm. civil liberty concerns within the sovereign confines of the United States, which is becoming part of a larger global world. Well, as I said, we do have sister organizations all over the uh, all over the world, and on particular issues, we will collaborate with them. Uh, there are other uh, examples of coalitions that will come together on particular issues. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, are they? Uh, would would it be? Is there is there is there is there a particular? We we can repair to the American Civil Liberties Union, and then we can go to the Montana chapter, or mm -hmm. we can go to the Alaska chapter, or New mm -hmm. York, Alabama, mm -hmm. or something. Mm -hmm. Are there? Is there another institution that is like the American, but but international, of which the American Civil Liberties Union would be like a state within the federal structure? No, the, there is, there not, is such, not. Can no. you see such a thing evolving? Uh, I certainly can. Mm -hmm. I think that's the task for the next century, if I may say so. Uh huh. Oh, it's not relevant to the time now. No, it certainly is relevant, but uh -huh. we have to proceed one step at a time. We're dealing with many countries that have, for the first time, uh, recognized any human rights, where for the first time you have people uh, beginning to develop a sense of organization and commitment and their first uh, concern understandably, understandably is going to be to defend their own rights in the most immediate context which is against their own government so Back I think one one has to be a little bit patient about these worldwide uh, you know grandiose schemes and I, I, I really look forward to it but I think we have to wait a little bit we're back to Marlboro versus Madison or something <laughs> and, uh, but, but, you know exactly. you know that kind uh, of thing issues and, that have been yeah. taken for granted here are uh -huh. in other places being fought out for the first time uh-huh uh-huh well that's a that's and then a you don't always have the tools available in other societies um, the independent judiciary you referred to Marbury versus Madison mm -hmm. I, I, I want to yeah. tell your listeners that that was a very important case in 1803 mm -hmm. which established something that was not clear mm -hmm. under the plain language of the Constitution namely that our federal courts have the power of judicial review to strike down as unconstitutional uh, a law that's passed even by an overwhelming majority of members of Congress. 
Uh, and that's power of the courts mm. to be there as a bulwark for individual rights and minority group rights has mm. not been established right, in every other country around well, the world. Well, I understand that. That's a little bit difficult for, you know, moving out into broader horizons with new... Uh, Frontiers and, and you and don't so take forth. a country and like Singapore, where you have, don't have an exactly. independent judiciary. Exactly. You exactly. know, a right may exist in, on exactly. paper, but if you can't get any government official to enforce it, well, it may I as well not exist. Well, it is a challenge, isn't it? It, yeah, it is a challenge, is. <laughs> to put it mildly. And so forth. But that's why, in a certain sense, it's, a, it's an interesting... If, if one is philosophically inclined toward the human family... I mean, we all come out of Africa 200,000 years ago, apparently, if the mito mitochondrial DNA research is correct. We're all of a common ancestor and we all get in the, the technological extension of consciousness. Uh, uh, the, 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 the technology is an extension of consciousness or the central nervous system in a certain <laughs> sense into the environment. And we get to a point where those, those, those things, it was moving so slowly until we got the steam engine and slowly, slowly, slowly we made some progress and so forth. And now that line's going L-shaped. Yeah. And something's going on yeah. in terms of the, the large order of business, and that's why I was asking you in a certain sense, we made an attempt, Eleanor Roosevelt, bless her, made an attempt in a different kind of environment at getting at something called a universal mm -hmm. declaration of human mm -hmm. rights. Mm -hmm. I don't know if we could get a universal declaration of civil rights, mm -hmm. uh, but it was beginning to, and they had to get over the differences that existed among the peoples of the world at that time. Of course, there were a few winners who could sort of set the tone. Exactly. But she struggled very difficult. It was really difficult to get the Soviets. Well, on there board. Was they the wanted major to argue for economic exactly. freedom and, so, and these questions of bringing them together in the United and Nations. And that debate still continues yeah. because hotly on the heels of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights were two international covenants. Mm -hmm. One called civil and political rights, which would be equivalent to the civil liberties that we've been talking about, yeah. but the other one called economic, social, and cultural rights, mm -hmm. which are rights that are recognized in socialist countries but are not deemed to be fundamental rights in our society, namely to government provision of economic security through jobs, through health benefits, education, welfare. There are many societies that believe that those are more important, or at least as important, as freedom of speech and freedom of religion. Mm -hmm. There are major philosophical differences there. There are, and they were fought out, I know, in that, in the covenants that followed, and they're still there. Those yes. problems are still there, and they're now being put forth on the Internet, mm -hmm. which is an international, uh, has an international, but it's almost we're coming full term, or, or we're coming into some sort of a, of a new relationship as we come up to the millennium. It, it's right. an exciting it's and there, an exciting and the, and now proposition. Some, some folks are a lot of questions. Yeah. In, in, in the developing world, you often hear talk of, of what's called a third generation of, of human rights, uh, namely rights to a clean environment and a healthy environment. And these are very interesting philosophical issues. I don't think we're going to reach a consensus anytime soon, which no. is another reason why uh, I said anytime soon. Uh. That's why I'm also a little right. cautious about you know a global you know, International Covenant. Human Rights Organization, yeah. I think on particular issues you will find coalitions of particular organizations in certain countries, but uh -huh. it's going to be, you know, and, and, and vive la différence. I'm glad to have debate and discussion among people uh, with different backgrounds and histories and traditions on these issues. Mm -hmm. There's all these traditions that are writ large on the world on the world scale. Again, come back to the United States is such a melting pot. It's such an interesting place where you come. And of the United States, New York is perhaps the most example <laughs> of uh, every culture imaginable here under a certain kind of a uh, certain kind of context and the american civil liberties union has uh has uh, has been in the in the lead of in, in the in well. We've the always defended rights of immigrants, and that is a struggle that has become very pointed in recent history. As we see uh, attacks, and they have certainly recurred throughout American history and throughout the history of the ACLU. But they're very sharp right now. Uh -huh. Attacks on rights of people who are um, immigrants <coughs> who are not yet citizens. Uh, both legal and illegal cutbacks, not only on their uh, economic benefits, but also cutbacks on other legal rights, such as right to due process of law and fair judicial procedures even before they're deported. Uh, it's, it's very sad, but uh, we face repeated points in our history, now being one of them, where uh, people lash out at immigrants as, as scapegoats. Yeah, scapegoats, yeah, immigrants and yeah, poor people and that 
kind the of thing. The usual. That, there's a lot of the usual suspects, mm -hmm. as they say, and so forth. Yeah, you know, I was really interested in that metaphor. And I, I congratulate you on your argumentation and others who were involved in terms of, uh, you know, Reno versus American Civil Liberties Union and protecting the internet. And, and that, that's to be good, that's to be uh, applauded. But I was very really also taken with this idea that, um, you know, that the technologies are there, mm -hmm. that we have these technologies that can address this one problem mm -hmm. that would be, you know, ta tailoring what would come into one one's own environment exactly. to protect against that. So that we have a technological capability of providing a system that people that fosters could, individual freedom of well, choice. It not only fosters individual freedom of choice, if I may, but that it also might allow for those who have objection to the idea of individual freedom of choice uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a, like an open society principle, it would allow them perhaps more comfortably be able to move into an open society if they were not going to have a, the, that it was not going to be intruded upon themselves, so that in a general principle, a philosophical base, they might feel more comfortable with the concept of an open society where all flowers can bloom if they are protected from having to be, or their children are. So there's a technological right. capability of, pro of, of confronting a conundrum right. that in human history has had to be dealt with by legal thought, by, 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 by philosophy, or by, by legal thought. That th th I guess what I'm trying to get at is, do you think that there are some of the ancient conundrums and, and problems that have confronted the human condition and the decision makers, the law community, um, that, that we may be coming to a time where Mr. Gilder's analogy of transcending, in a that you could say in a certain sense, we had a limitation, it was a bandwidth limitation on rights, I think but that we're getting to a point where we can have uh, a situation where we're transcending scarcity in terms of our ability with technological augmentation, then you could bring in ecological safeguards and so forth, that we have a knowledge base that we didn't have in the past that makes it possible for us to come into some new way of operating that can transcend scarcity as an, a reality in, w in terms of which we set up our human institutions? And if so, that's a huge transformation that might be the offing of the time in which we find ourselves, and we would be handmaidens to the birth of the final gestation of the human experience and come into a liberated condition that we've all been working toward, perhaps unknowingly throughout the human evolution? No. Okay, good. Okay. <laughs> Let me clarify. Please. <laughs> I think that uh, <laughs> technology and the developments that you've described and that George Gilder have, has described uh, certainly will help us solve some problems, okay. including civil liberties problems, okay. but it also creates new problems problems. On the other hand. Um, of course. I mean, <laughs> yes. not only does this technology, mm -hmm. uh, Ithiel de Sola Poole wrote a wonderful book yes. called Technologies of Freedom, mm -hmm. but just as these technologies can be used to enhance freedom, mm -hmm. of course, there's always a darker side. They can always be harnessed to enhance government power and to restrict individual freedom. The most frightening possibility there as far as um, the internet and the online communication world is concerned is the potential for completely obliterating individual privacy. Uh, we leave an electronic trail now of everything about ourselves, mm -hmm. what our interests are, what yeah. our tastes are, with oh, whom we communicate, what we yeah. say, what our purchases are, our travel patterns, yeah. you name it. And yeah. unless there is some massive intervention very quickly, uh, Big Brother is with us. And oh, Big we Brother have, would be a threat. Yes. So, so, and, and another problem that I think is related to the point you were making earlier. But they do need the information for the system to work right. We well, that's what I'm saying. Everything yeah. is a double-edged sword. Now, when you're talking about the ability of individuals to shield themselves from the larger society where they might find ideas that are offensive to them and threatening to them, the positive side is they can create their own online virtual community by mm -hmm. communicating only with those people whose values and interests they share. Right. That's fine in yeah. one sense, yeah. but it's a little frightening in another sense yeah, because I, we'll lose the hurly-burly right. and exchange right. of that melting pot that you and I uh, both so much enjoy about yeah, three-dimensional right. life yeah. here in New York City. Well, I know. I agree. And it wasn't only George Gilder who said that. George Gilder, but it was Bucky Fuller, mm -hmm. God bless him, who mm -hmm. said that, uh, you know, it's an a priori mysterious design to the structure of what he would call universal mind, that it's synergistic, it's a synergistic resonancy 
that inter accommodates all systems and universe and it might be that we're coming to a time there was a consciousness before homo sapiens sapien in the evolution on this planet and we have been for two hundred thousand years in this thing i guess that's what i was reaching for where is it leading where is it going i saw a tony hall the other day and he was president of bbc and he said that uh the big undiscovered or the unreported issue by the journalistic community was uh, globalization and the effects of that, that they don't report on it nearly enough. And that he said, we used to talk about the missile gap and the mm -hmm. old, remember we talked yes. missile gap? Yes. He said what we have, we're being inundated with information capability. Mm -hmm. It could permit pattern recognition, which mm -hmm. is a human psyche uh, capability that we have, to see things where you get information overload within a system but mm -hmm. we can see whole patterns and that, that pattern might be uh, one that makes it possible for us to to see that we're coming into some new relation but he said we have an information under we have an information understanding gap we don't have systems of understanding what does it mean and where is it leading mm -hmm. and is it leading to something that can only be seen in a certain sense transcendent to the systems within which we are doing all of this out of which we've grown you, you don't quite understand what we, you know what a, trying to say is that well that's we're very into... philosophical and speculative and I think could perhaps be better answered by a philosopher mm. than by a civil liberties activist mm. but uh, civil liberties would certainly reflect tie. certain underlying philosophical beliefs but I, I take as as my charter mm -hmm. um, the aspirations that were stated by the founders of our country in the Declaration of Independence that all men are created equal right. and endowed by their creator, whoever right. or whatever that might right. be, right. with certain unalienable rights. Right. And that the purpose <laughs> of instituting government is in order to protect those rights. So uh, obviously at the time that those words were first expressed in 1776, we were, uh, 1775, we were very far from mm -hmm. actually realizing those ideals. Yeah. Uh, but I think the course of human history, including technological developments mm -hmm. and other developments, has brought us ever closer to those ideals. My hope and my aspiration is that we will continue to harness technology and other developments in our human history to bring us closer and closer to those ideals. To those ideals without being concerned with well, my, I'm, uh, we used to have we used to have we have my, my scotch grandmother used <laughs> to sing sing a uh, song to me and it, you know it used to be we don't know where we're going but we're on our way it's an old <laughs> scotch song you know that in a resonating synergistic kind of sense that we're coming into some sort of a new relationship other than uh, the what James Joyce called history. history. James Joyce said history is a nightmare from which we're attempting to awaken. <laughs> but you I think guess we're what not I'm saying is I, quite th awake. I think that there are some values that I can't imagine, unless human nature completely changes, I can't imagine abandoning those values. No, I don't mean yeah. to. Well, all right. Yeah. yeah, obviously I'm not. I, mean, I was just sort of reaching for some sort of thing. Where is it all going? And mm -hmm. if there's an institution, then it raises a lot of interesting questions for sure. The situation we're in, the Chinese say, to save us from living in interesting times. Right. We certainly live in interesting <laughs> times, and if there's an institution that has helped preserve the civil liberties and kept a good watch on that and everything, uh, that sort of thing, it's the American Civil Liberties, and I thank you very much for oh, all your work. It was great to talk to you, Harold. It was great thank talking you. with you, and it's been your pleasure. Sorry, we're running out of time. Pleasure to talk. Nadine Strauss, she's president of the American Civil Liberties Union, has been for a few years now and has been performing mightily there to keep our civil liberties intact and uh, happy to have been able to bring you those perceptions. We invite you to tune in. We'll be coming back again next week. That's it for now, Nadine. Once again, thank you very much. Thank indeed. you so much, Harold. Until